in the great Serena Williams in a Grand Slam final. Her older sister Venus, her arch rival Maria and Sam Stozer. The Queenslander became the first Australian woman in three decades to win a major when she took down the mighty Williams in her own backyard. But as Australia's top ranked female tennis player, she has had to endure the weight of public expectation. And at times it's been a heavy load. Sam, thanks for being here. Thank you. Grand Slam winner, it's got a nice ring to it. You're sort of still reminded about it uh, even three or four years on? Oh, sure. It's, um, yeah, it was an absolute dream come true and, and I guess a moment that you never really knew if it was going to happen and what it would feel like if and when it did. So, um, yeah, it was just an unbelievable feeling. I'm sure I've kind of blocked out parts of it and then, uh, yeah, other parts are obviously very vivid still. Is it true that the US Open trophy is in the entrance hall of your apartment in Sydney? I wouldn't say it's a big entrance hall, but it is by the front door. So I guess every time I walk out the door or come home, then um, yeah, it's certainly right there, front and centre in the middle, which is nice to see every time. Let's uh, go back to where it all began. You were living in Adelaide, you were eight years old, and a neighbour, a very um, giving neighbour, <laughs> gave you a, a tennis racket for, for a Christmas present. What are your memories of that and, and stepping out onto the court for the very first time? Yeah, I, re I remember the racket. It was a white aluminium one with multicoloured strings, um, a little junior one. And I, I, my older brother was playing tennis just at school for, for fun. And um, eventually we went down to the local park and started playing. And then probably about six months on, he kind of told mum and dad, oh, maybe Sam should get some lessons. She seems all right at it. And then eventually kind of got down that road and um, yeah, went for, went for my first lesson actually at Memorial Drive. And uh, it was a little group thing, and um, yeah, I, I really enjoyed it. There was a few tears before I got there. I wasn't too sure about it, but then once I was there, I was uh, feeling, yeah, really at home, I guess, on the court straight away. You've got a really tight-knit, close family, your mum, Diane, and your, your father, Tony, and they spent a lot of long hours working and operating in cafes while you were a kid. Yep. And so your older brother, as you already mentioned, Daniel, sort of had a, a really big role in you and tennis, and he almost sacrificed his early life and stages of career to support you? Yeah, he did. Um, Daniel's eight years older than me and like you said, mum and dad ran cafes so they were out early and back home late and um, I guess unfortunately for him he had to look after his little brother and sister after school and I guess almost get us ready for school as well. So he was the one that kind of, I guess, knew the most about tennis and when I started playing tournaments and getting into it then um, he kind of led the way almost. Uh, mum and dad didn't even know how to score. None of us knew really what was going on, but I guess, uh, yeah, Daniel really, I guess, learnt quickly and was able to push me in the right direction. And you're exposed to the Australian Open at a really early age. Great story. You're a nine-year-old and your mum and dad decide to, what, what a great holiday, take you to, uh, to Melbourne Park for a weekend. Yeah, what happened? Um, yeah, it was just, uh, I guess I was already loving tennis and they, um, I, I don't know whether it was a surprise or not, but I can't remember, they took our whole family from Adelaide to Melbourne for the women's final and I watched my two favourite players, Steffi and Monica, um, battle it out there. I wore my Steffi Graf outfit. I'm sure I took my racket to the court for some reason and um, my younger brother actually fell asleep during it and woke up and thought, he said whoever was going to win at the end, so I'm sure they weren't too pleased about paying for the ticket for him. But um, yeah, I remember the match, still the, the corner that we were sitting in and um, I loved Steffi and I also loved Monica. So um, yeah, they were my two favourites. Um, even to this day, I, I uh, actually met Monica last year at a tournament in Toronto and felt really childish and went back into the gym and asked her for a photo. So I was like, oh, that was great. I actually got to meet, yeah, one of my heroes growing up. You're one of the fittest players on tour. 22 tournaments a year you aim to play, so that's nine months travelling, just the three months home in Sydney. Uh, are you more fanatical about diet or training in the gym? Probably my training, I think um, I try and eat well and be sensible, but I certainly um, throw in a few little bad things every now and then. But I think if I'm training and doing everything that I need to do, you can't afford to have those little luxuries along the way. I think you, you still got to live, you still got to enjoy. And um, yeah, if you can do your training and, and get that all done, then why not? Got to ask about the guns because everyone's jealous about them. <laughs> Is that right that you've never done a bicep curl? I don't do bicep curls, I do lots of other things obviously, but um, I've never worked specifically on my biceps. So you would never have a quiet moment in front of the mirror and just, you know... I just pump them out? Yes. No, I don't, I don't do, do that, that today. <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness, um, your physique and your style of play has drawn criticism from, from opponents over the years, particularly at the French Open. Uh, it just happens to be when you beat them. But uh, Sybil Kova and Yelena Yankovic have both lost matches to you at the French Open and then said afterwards, well, she plays like a man. Mm -hmm. How do you react to that? And it, I mean, it looks like sour grapes, but yeah. how do you react to it? Uh, I think the first time it happened, it was 
yeah, I didn't like it, that's for sure. And then... Uh, it's disrespectful. Yeah, it's, it's not... I don't know, it's, it's hard to explain. It's not, a, I guess, a nice, flattering thing to have said about you but um at the end of the day i obviously overpowered them play I, I do play tennis a little bit differently to a lot of women because of my spin um and they're just not used to that at the end of the day it's it's water up a duck's back sometimes you don't like it but i can move on from that what's the best tennis match you've ever played i think the best match i've ever played was in the final of charleston uh it was 2010 i was playing Vera Zvonareva in the final and i was six love three love up i think and i could not miss a ball. I was hitting winners all over the place. That everything was going in. Um, even if I just hit it off the frame, somehow it was going in. And, and uh, it's just seems so easy. It's it's weird. Like you want to be able to do that every single day, and you try so hard for it. And then when it does happen, it seems really easy. And you don't you don't really think about anything. It just everything flows and happens. And you walk off the court and think, oh, tennis is easy. I'll be able to do that tomorrow. And then all of a sudden, you can't do it tomorrow, and you wonder why. What's the worst tennis match you've ever played? That would be against Emily Morismo in uh, Miami many years ago. I lost six love, six love on centre court and I wanted to dig a hole and jump in it probably at about six love, two love. Um, that was a horrible, horrible moment and uh, that court actually, all the players lounge, you can eat, be in the restaurant and watch centre court and all I could think about at that point was I can only imagine how many people are watching this match up in the player play restaurant I wanted to get out of there so quick. Early success was in doubles. Was was that something deliberate, or a priority, or how did it come about? Because you won, you've won five Grand Slam titles in doubles, mixed and, and mm -hmm. women's doubles, and your first one was Scott Draper, and you were just 21 at the Australian Open. Yeah, no, that was absolutely um, by mistake, really. I was always uh, trying to be a good singles player, and then uh, Lisa Raymond actually asked me to play doubles, and I thought, wow, that's a, a great opportunity. Um, to play with her. So we started playing and actually didn't get off to a very good start at all. We won one match in the first four weeks and uh, a couple of weeks before the US Open um, she told me she might start looking for a new partner. I said, hang on, let's just give it give it another go. And uh, ended up winning the US Open, won a bunch of tournaments at the end of that year and then a little while later got to number one and had a really successful partnership. So it was just kind of uh, by her asking me to play and then, like I said, something clicked and then all of a sudden we were off and I became this kind of double specialist um, player for some reason, even though I was still always playing singles, I was still ranked in the top 50, top 30 maybe, um, but yeah, just was always doing well in doubles for us for that period of time. So life's pretty good, you're travelling around the world, you're, you're winning doubles titles and it gets to Wimbledon 2007 and disaster strikes. What happened? Uh, I just started feeling really sick and uh, got really puffy, all my glands were up. Um, I looked terrible, I looked like I had no neck, I looked terrible and I uh, was at the courts and yeah, all my friends, everyone around me obviously knew that there was something wrong and I uh, kept going to the doctors and probably saw a different doctor every day for about four or five days and then it wasn't until the US Open and eventually um, they diagnosed me with Lyme disease. Which is? Uh, it's a tick-borne disease that, um, it's a deer tick, I don't know where I got that, I, I actually have a feeling I got it uh, in Paris that year. And then it wasn't until Wimbledon that I started getting some symptoms and like every day it seemed to change. Didn't know what was going on, but every day I felt worse and something was, was happening. Pain in my head was just excruciating. And uh, later on that night, then they did a, a spinal tap and told me I had that viral meningitis. So that was definitely the worst point. And I know it's a long time now, it's, it's in the past, but some people close to you say it, it bizarrely could have been the best thing that happened to your tennis career. Yeah, in a way, I think it could have been. Um, who knows whether I, w I would have made that decision to kind of pull back on the doubles a little bit and start really, you know, making a big push for my singles. And um, I think it is one of those things where you kind of, you've done something for so long, you kind of get in this little bit of a groove and um, don't necessarily know where it can take you. And then when it's taken away from you without you wanting it to be, um, you realise how much you love it and how much you really think you've got more to give and more to do and, and I think that's exactly what happened with me. So it certainly made you reevaluate not just tennis but life as well. Stay with us because uh, coming up after the break, Sam's crowning moment at the US Open and the struggle to deal with public expectation.